Cambodia was not a place I had been before, nor was it a place I had ever planned to go. This whole disastrous expedition started when a friend of mine pitched it as a solution to my looming monetary woes. It offered me a cheap cost of living, many times lower than I could have found back in the States, a way to continue to work for myself as a copywriter without having to seek part-time work at some soul-crushing depression factory in the service industry. Perhaps more importantly, she saw it as a way to force me out of my shell into more regular interactions with the world around me. Though I have never been prodded and probed for any traditional diagnosis, I am an excessively reserved person, with a disruptive distaste for interaction with new people in places that has long dictated the ebb and flow of my days. I would not describe the way I interact with the world as fearful, but rather disinterested. I find great comfort in stewing alone among my thoughts for long periods, undisturbed by the intrusion of anything I don't grant permission to intrude. The king of my own keep, in a sense, with the drawbridge firmly fastened against all but the most familial and vital company. Having seen me forced into a semi-regular schedule of public outings and social gatherings in college, my longtime friend thought this trip abroad could solve the dread of a 9-to-5 job and my penchant for self-isolation in one fell swoop, allowing me fiscal security and independence on my own terms while also forcing me to do a bit of learning and exploring to find my way in a new place. Ever the schemer, she had sold the idea with a salesperson's gusto that made her hard to rebuff, and the initial plan had been for us to go together, for she too was in search of greener and significantly cheaper pastures. The passing of her mother and the subsequent stress this placed on her family prevented this, and a departure together turned into a sort of delayed entry plan, with me deciding to keep my booked flight and go ahead, and her planning to follow in five or six months' time when things at home allowed her to operate for herself again. The first week or so went smoothly enough. I picked up these social lubricant words. Hello, please, thank you, that sort of thing. I made myself get out and see some of the museums in Phnom Penh. It was uncomfortable. The heat and my desire for quiet scratching at the back of my skull but I was busy and entertained enough seeing sights and exploring temples to ignore it. That all changed once a week or two had passed, and I'd gotten settled in. Stripped of the excitable tourist's fresh eyes and forgiving demeanor, the city became a different animal, as experience stripped away the veneer of charm, and I laid eyes upon the true face beneath the mask. The filth of Nam Pin is omnipresent, its trash heaps ever looming and spilling into the streets while dogs run over weeks ago burst with maggots in the heat upon streets moldering after decades of neglect. The canals, murky stew pots filled with sewage and the rain-sodden garbage knocked down from the streets, stink under the heat of the sun as it rises through the day, making certain sectors of the concrete forest almost intolerable. Rats the size of a man's forearm and roaches longer than my thumb flourish in the tropical heat amidst the murk, bold enough to leap over shoes and scuttle underfoot as pedestrians walk after dark. Wat Nam, a well-aged jewel of a temple the better part of a thousand years old, is stalked by as many prostitutes as trinket vendors, its beauty lost in the sea of social decay. My rearing in southeastern Kentucky had taught me of poverty, but it was the utter dissolution of shame and restraint that truly shook me. One reading this might think that this is an indictment of Cambodia's capital, but it isn't uniquely a Cambodian problem. Cities in my home country, from New York to San Francisco to Atlanta, exhibit the same kind of disarray and filth, even if a better organizational structure keeps the visual horror in check. Human beings, packed in atop one another in numbers beyond tally, lose grasp of what life was like outside the Towers of Stone and lose grasp of the niceties and boundaries that made existence tolerable before such terrible numbers were brought to bear. Even as the residents of such urban strongholds as Chicago or London proclaim their cultured produce of theater or art, 
they live existences that would make the founders of civilization weep. If whatever priest kings raised Sumeria's cities in the cradle of civilization could have witnessed the Nam Pen of today, they would have burnt their creations to the ground to spare future generations such torment. The Mouse Utopia experiment comes to mind. I should have expected such things, for I had seen cities of scale, whose occupants numbered in the millions, before. But the starry-eyed hope of the tourist, combined with the sense of adventure and challenge promised by a new and uncomfortable environment, blinded me to the weight of the Stygian nightmare that is metropolitan life until I was already set up in my apartment with a six-month lease to my name. The apartment, however, was comfortable, my landlady hospitable, and my rent spectacularly low. I resolved, as those first few weeks came to an end, that I would keep my head down, avoid discouragement, and get as much work done as possible while I wrote out the inexpensive rent and mitigated my exposure to the outside world as much as possible. In half a year, with ten or twelve months of work under my belt in half the time, I could return to the States, either bolstered by more steady clients or stabilized by enough stored cash to keep me secure while I sought other ways to buoy my income. My friend, should she still aim to follow me then, could have the urban sprawl. I had seen more than enough already. My existence was one of nearly monastic solitude, scheduled around outings which were planned with great care to ensure the least friction possible. I left my room just once every week, to walk about eight blocks to a 24-hour grocery on a street not far from mine. During the first of these trips each month, I would stop by an ATM down a side street along the way and withdraw around $400 for rent and groceries. And on the way back, I would drop the $200 owed for the month's rent through the slot on my landlady's door. The trips initially were plotted out to avoid the heat of the day, starting around nine at night. But after being accosted by a trio of toothless ladyboys astride a motorcycle looking for clients during one of these trips, I moved the schedule past midnight, to around two in the morning. At this hour, the residential streets were entirely empty save the occasional honking passage of a cab or a motorbike, and offered me as placid an atmosphere to navigate the trash warrens as was possible. My safety from the city's occasional knife crime ensured by the fact that I was nearly a foot taller than the tallest Cambodian man I had seen since landing in the country. I was left alone with the rats and the stray dogs to operate like clockwork, counting the paces from block to block, knowing that it would take me nine minutes out and nine minutes back to complete my grocery run. Between these walks, in the solitude of my apartment, only the occasional gecko scurrying in under the balcony door of the fourth floor room to escape the heat by camping on the cool interior wall troubled my doorstep, and I didn't mind the silent intrusion. I ate, worked out, scanned email and job posting boards for writing contracts, and typed. My focus was so complete that I could forget the days of the week, the hour of the day, and the posturing of the world beyond, the heavily curtained windows of my room keeping the dreadful humid sun of the equator at bay. There are many who would balk at that sparse a schedule, but with the occasional call to a friend or sibling back home keeping me connected, I had all the contact I needed. I thrive in a space all my own, on my own, and with nothing save a concrete hell beyond my door to distract me, my work flourished in the months I spent holed up in Nam Pen, right up until I took my second-to-last walk, as the day of my escape closed in on me. I had just over five weeks to go before April 22nd, my planned departure date. I began my walk, aiming for the familiar store down the street and following my route without a single hiccup, mulling over a braggadocious biography I was working on for an Indian businessman's personal website, my mind straying as far away from the squalor of the street as was possible. The road was unusually vacant, with only one or two loud bikes sputtering past during my initial trip. My shopping was done with mechanical precision, the same twelve items bought with the same three bills, a thank you to the now familiar night cashier, and away I went, 
tossing a few cashew nuts to a friendly and legendarily mangy mutt that haunted the corner a block down from the shop when he approached to greet me, as was tradition. Things only went south near the end of the trip, when I reached one of the canals on the way back. The canal, perhaps fifteen feet deep with a stew of stagnant liquid haunting its innards, ran off to both sides, visible in either direction for a block or so before another concrete bridge similar to the one I crossed blocked my view. It abutted the road which intersected my own, and as I looked down the way to ensure no speeding rickshaws or bikes were headed my direction, a burst of motion on the bridge to my left caught my eye. My initial thought was that a mugging was underway, but as I slowed and took in the scene on the quiet streets of the sleeping quarter of the city, I quickly dismissed that possibility. An older man, who I can remember spotting on prior walks leaning against the canal rail as he dragged on cigarettes, had been seized from behind, a large figure nearly enveloping him as they struggled on the far bridge. This figure, a man at first glance, was overstretched and disproportioned, its skin the greenish-gray color of mold and its nude form tapering from a man's wiry torso into a writhing lower body that looked almost like a snake's. This tail, if that's the word to describe it, was affixed to a rusted metal beam beneath the bridge, the willowy creature having clambered up over the rail to seize its target unaware. Its massive hands enveloped the old man's head, whatever protest or screaming might have been done muffled before it could begin. Whenever he fell, perhaps four or five seconds after I first spotted this baffling struggle, the creature let him fall, a fleshy tongue latched to its prey following the man's throat as he went down. It stayed there, perched on the rail, for a few more seconds as it finished its work. Then... The tongue came free with an audible pop, a spike at its end making me think of hypodermic needles or a mosquito's proboscis. This tongue withdrew with lightning speed like a frog's before, in one fluid motion, the creature swung back under the bridge and dropped with a muted splash into the thick suit below in the canal, the ripples of its impact invisible in the shadows cast by the streetlights above. An approaching truck Perhaps the source of its departure rumbled past on the road along the canal, jolting me back to awareness. After a glance back up at the man on the bridge, now lying lifeless on the pavement, a gleam of the truck's lights brought my eyes back down to the water of the canal, where two glimmering pools of reddish light gazed at me from the obscuring shadow. I didn't need any more motivation than that. I sprinted across the next street and up the following four blocks, almost to my building's locked door in the alley off the road and fumbling with the keys in my pocket before I risked a glance back down the road towards the canal. The street was empty despite the pursuit I imagined was underway, but that didn't stop me from shouldering through the entrance the second the key was turned and tossing my bagged groceries to the floor without mind for the noise, spinning to bar the metal door at my back the second I was safely inside. I gathered them up, stormed up the steep steps winding their way through the haphazard building, and hastily unlocked my own door, suddenly painfully aware of how close my top-floor apartment sits to the open exit onto the covered roof where the laundry machines rest just up the stairs. Once my own door was bolted behind me, I could catch my breath, dwell on the insanity of what had just occurred, and weigh my options. Fast deciding there was no way a report to the local police could end well, I opted to stay silent for the moment and tell my story in a slightly edited form should I ever be questioned, with the seemingly inexplicable nature of the attacker evaded as best was possible. I settled into my usual routine as faithfully as I could, but vexation about what had occurred kept me from being the paragon of focus that was the norm. My work suffered, and my sleep suffered more. My already nocturnal schedule now a godsend as paranoia made me dread the thought of slumber in a darkened room. There was little rational drive to fear when I was locked away in my sturdy old apartment, but fear haunted me all the same. 
It was, perhaps, this heightened sense of paranoia that ballooned my awareness enough to allow me to perceive the odd sounds which infiltrated the neighborhood in the days following my sighting. In the dead of night, hours after the early rising city had closed its doors and dimmed its lights, a kind of cackling screech could occasionally be heard echoing down the alleys and through the streets, a far cry from the cat screams and dog barks native to the area which themselves seem to have been erased from the night's ambience. The best I can do to describe it is to indicate the more otherworldly vocalizations of foxes, but these calls were of a much deeper pitch and carried a far greater distance around the rotten city they stalked. My isolated mind invested these noises with the shape of that thing from the canal bringing its corpse-like flesh to my imagination as a companion to every scream through sleeping Nam Pin. This persisted throughout the next week, growing more pronounced as the due date for my rent and the bottom of my food supply marched closer by the day. When the 22nd of March came, I had formulated a plan, one I felt sure would both appease my paranoia and keep me safe and secure until my departure in a month's time. I would leave the building, braving the crowds, hookers, and curious children of the early evening to feel more secured against things that go bump in the nights amidst busier streets, and hit the ATM, retrieving my final rent payment and the money for that month's groceries. Then, I would buy everything I could carry at the store, cautious to ration it once I got it back to my building, eliminating the need for any more shopping excursions during my stay in Cambodia. Finally, I would slip my rent through my landlady's door, finalizing my fortified existence until April 22nd at last released me from my self-imposed prison, all the while safe from the twisted phantoms I now imagined behind every corner on the streets outside. The walk was uneventful, but continuously slowed by my jittery scans of the world around me, each clatter of rats in the trash heaps or small stalls closing up shop for the night, making my heart leap at the sound. I diverted from my road toward the ATM one block down from where I usually walked to the southerly street, not wishing to walk alongside the canal where I had seen that inexplicable sight a week prior. I still had to cross the bridge on the way over, though a process made only slightly easier by the passage of a loud band of drunken Australian expats on their way back from a bar, the raucous laughter making it seem less treacherous. Without incident, I rounded a corner and came within sight of the ATM, glad on one level that there were no people around this little street to witness a foreigner withdrawing cash, but equally perturbed by the silence that seemed to rule this little stretch of roadway. The hum of Khmer Rouge-era streetlights overhead seemed to strangle the honks and engine growls of neighboring streets, my footfalls sounding catastrophically loud to me in a way I knew was imagined. I ignored my nerves and pressed into the little booth, focusing on the task at hand. Flying through the process of the withdrawal with practiced ease urged on by the oppressive memory of the canal just up the road from where I stood. I emerged with money stowed safely away less than a minute later. I thought I noticed, during my paranoid scan of the roadway upon exiting the booth, a flurry of motion in the direction of the hated canal, but there were several gargantuan rats running here and there upon the roadway, so it was easy to shrug this off as a peripheral misinterpretation. Still, I made with speed for the store, going about my business with the same level of calculated efficiency as I had in the ATM. Outside, I was momentarily distracted by the absence of the familiar dog that had haunted the street corner, but even after shaking the tin of cashews I'd bought, he didn't surface, and I resolved to move on. By the time I passed the canal, balancing three dangerously overfilled plastic bags on each side of me like some surf hauling grain, I estimated I had made better time on this final outing than on any other walk I'd made in the country thus far. Glances to either side of me showed nothing but the stinking cauldron of refuse below, and the omnipresent thrum of engines and voices guided me safely past the water and into the home stretch of this expedition into the urban unknown. It was only in the last harrowing minutes of the trip that things truly went south. 
I arrived at my building's door, about a third of the way down an alley which led to a little courtyard of dumpsters between the adjacent buildings, and set my bags on the ground to get the door unlocked, keys fast springing to hand. It was only after I had the door open and bent to grab the bags once more that I thought I spied a silhouette as it jerked back around the corner. My impression was of a head and shoulders rapidly withdrawn, but as I stood there in the bluish glow of the streetlight staring after movement I wasn't certain was real, nothing resurfaced, and I forced myself to move into the door and bar it behind me, my fortress now closer than ever. My rent dropped off in typical fashion. I brushed past and up the steep stairs, turning on and off lights on each floor to show me the way through the dark, mindful not to crush geckos, spending the night in the cool stairway. I rounded one corner, then the next, finally reaching the top floor apartment and once more setting down my bags to undo the padlock and enter my holdfast, safe from the world outside. I glanced to the rooftop doorway, thankful to see no trace of movement, and brought my bags inside, setting them right against the fridge and doubling back to lean out my door and turn off the light on the stairway. It was then that I saw it. With the light clicked off, I turned, hand on the sturdy metal door handle, to close my apartment behind me. And as my eyes passed the moonlit canvas through the open rooftop exit up the little stairway next to my door, I froze. Hanging from above the top of the doorway, which had been empty just a moment before, long fingers gripping the top of the doorframe like a windowsill, was a noseless, slack-jawed face with great reddish eyes not dissimilar to those of a frog, blessedly obscured by the newly fallen darkness in the stairway. Beneath the wavering flap of skin making up its fleshy jaw, a tapering worm of pinkish sinew weaved back and forth like a snake charmer's charge, its needle-like tip glinting with noxious spittle that dripped in moldering pools upon the tile of the stairs. The second's hesitation felt long, halted, as if played out at half speed, but as it moved to swing itself into the stairway, I slammed shut the door in one fluid motion, the bolt being jammed into place with another. The door, forged of heavy metal and built to deter burglars, shouldn't budge, but I backed away nonetheless, expecting some terrible clatter as the thing pounded against the gatehouse of its escaped prey. Instead, silence fell, and I was left standing in my front room between the sink and the fridge, groceries forgotten, for a half hour as I listened for noises from the stairway which never came. Once I finally made myself move, I crept up to the metal door and listened. Minutes stretched on and still no sound came. Relenting after nearly an hour on watch by the door, I backed away, at a loss as to how I should interpret what had just happened. All I could do in that moment was to ensure the padlock holding the bolt in place on the door was fastened, and that the lock set into the handle was turned, put the groceries away, and dim the lights. There were just three rooms in the apartment, with the kitchen and an adjoining bathroom up front and the bedroom and back, and it was here that I holed up for the night. The balcony door, of the same metal make as the front door, was kept permanently locked, and the bars upon the window were well positioned and close together, giving me more than enough security to feel at least mildly safe. The night passed in silence, my mind on nothing save the rooftop doorway and that thing from the canal, until, at long last, the sun rose and the noises of the street swelled outside, allowing me enough ease to finally sleep. Waking that afternoon from dreams stalked by rot-bathed wraiths and skittering rats, I immediately checked and double-checked that my rationing plan was in order, and that my stored food could last me through the next four weeks. Then, stealing myself for the wait and trying my best to focus on work, I sat before my computer and pecked away at its keys finding myself absently staring at the curtained window and pondering the streets beyond much more frequently than I'm comfortable admitting. 
when the sun set, stripping the thin lines of light from the edges of the curtains, I allowed paranoia to creep back in, silencing the music I had been playing and killing the loud fan in my room despite the heat, working in silence over my laptop with my ear honed for anything amiss. The first night passed peacefully, my greatest disturbance being that those fox-like screeches had rather conspicuously disappeared from the streets outside, leaving the world beyond my curtained window and occasionally motorbike-desecrated churchyard of hushed anticipation. I planned my meals so that I did all my cooking in the front room kitchen near the stairs before the night had fallen, so the relative safety of my back room aided me in feeling at ease while I replayed in my mind the image of the slinking wretch from the canal hanging from the roof. I made an effort to sleep better the following day, settling in earlier in the morning and rising later in the afternoon, but that didn't stop me from feeling haggard and worn by nightfall, the days of fretting starting to catch up to me. The second night would not go so smoothly. It was two hours past midnight when I noticed a sniffing, not dissimilar from a dog's, but pitched low, like that of the black bears back home, emanating from the bottom of my balcony door. It sounded once, drawing my eyes to the door in the dark, the blackness of the balcony beyond preventing me from making out any shadows cast on the small space between the door and the tiled floor. I froze and made as little noise as I could manage, ears straining for more sound, None came for fifteen or twenty agonized minutes, the air itself seeming cooler under the icy press of this terrified atmosphere. Then, a tendril of glistening flesh crept in beneath the door, snaking along the tiles like a serpent, its dark, wet form easily visible, even in the darkened bedroom against the pale linoleum of the ground. The stink of the canals, after a day's boiling in the sun, slunk in with it, permeating the room almost as soon as I spotted the intrusion. At its tip, the familiar pointed stinger or needle gleamed, leading its exploration of the room. From where I sat upon my bed, situated in the opposite corner of the room from the door, I inched back upon the mattress into the furthest corner still endeavoring to make as little noise as possible. The thing on the balcony seemed to sense this, and the seeking tongue made its way for the bed, bringing the worst sorts of fear-conjured images to mind. Fortunately for me, the length of the vile protrusion fell short, and after several moments of straining there against the door in vain, it was withdrawn disappearing back out into the night from whence it came and leaving a sort of slick snail trail in its wake. The tongue's owner did not depart, though, occasionally sniffing at the crevice over the next hour or so, seeing if its quarry would attempt to move. When dawn began to approach, the noises died away as the thing returned to whatever safe hideaway it kept during the sun's waking hours and I fell into a nightmare-addled sleep, continuously waking to check the balcony door and sleeping with my closed eyes honed on the entryway, ready to snap open at the faintest sound. That afternoon, still at a loss as to how I would report such an invasion without being accused of lunacy, I took my defense into my own hands. I went about fortifying my position against this new threat, setting my suitcase against the door to obscure the crevice at the base and weighing it down with filled water bottles and Tupperware to add bulk, covering these with shoes, clothes, spare cutlery, and anything else I could find that I felt would hinder the interloper. With perhaps seventy pounds crammed into the suitcase, my mind could sit a little easier. The next few nights, the thing continued its visits but with its tongue rebuffed by the suitcase, its probing was limited to sniffing at the door. By the end of the first week, the stalker from the canal seemed to have moved on, with those familiar fox-like noises I had begun to attach to its jawless visage resuming their serenade out on the streets of the city, echoing to my ears now and then. Days returned to normal, 
my paranoia gradually receding as first one week and then another was passed in relative peace. It was not to last, and during my final week in the apartment, my nocturnal visitor would pay me one last, unexpected call. Though my nights had become less dreadful, that did not mean I had grown careless. Always, I endeavored to have my lights dimmed and my apartment silenced by sunset, to have any food or water I planned to consume during the night squirreled away next to my bed, and to get any necessary trips to the bathroom out of the way while the sunlight still shone on the roof above. That evening, I had decided to shower before the night confined me to my back room, beginning around six while the sunset had yet to deepen the hues of the horizon beyond my walls. With nights being passed without air conditioning to better acquaint my ears with the world outside the window, I valued going into what I knew would be an uncomfortably humid night clean and relaxed. I had only been in the bathroom for three or four minutes, eyes closed against the water, when the fan mounted on the wall of the little space halted its sudden silence oddly deafening. With power outages common in Phnom Penh, I fast shook away the water and backed out of the stream from the inexpensive wall-mounted water heating system on the wall, expecting my eyes to find the bathroom dark and anticipating a drop in water temperature after a loss of electricity. The cramped space, to my surprise, was still lit. The building was old, and I am fortunate in that moment I didn't just ignore the halted fan and go about my business. Perhaps, even if I didn't consciously associate the stairs with the fan at that moment, I reflexively recalled on some deeper level how close that fan set into the wall was on the stairway outside to the rooftop doorway, where, just one month ago, some unknown wretch had writhed in search of a new feast. My real salvation, however was that wretched stink from the canals. Reaching my nose and putting my heart into a ragged sprint, I looked to my right, eyes finding the small, dust-choked fan in the wall, and what I saw there sent me stumbling out the bathroom door and slamming it behind me with the water still running. It would stay that way for nearly two days, only being switched off when my landlady walked upstairs one morning to complain about how much water I must be using. Hanging there, twitching and thrashing in an attempt to force its way through the small opening between the plastic fan blades, was the familiar sheen of that needle-like proboscis, its bulk having stopped the fan cold while its owner hung latched on the wall of the stairway outside like some twisted vampiric tree frog, invisible to me save for that insectile, otherworldly tongue. Eventually, my departure date arrived and I had long worried that I would exit my apartment with suitcase and wallet in hand for my final walk down the precarious stairs to collect my security deposit and make for the airport, only to find my unwanted visitor clinging to the stairway roof in protest to the sunlight outside, ready to finish the job. No such terrors came to pass. I arrived home about 24 hours after walking out the door for the final time staying with friends until I could secure my own place, having survived that otherworldly visitor on the stairway. I have never, in several years spent pondering the events since, been able to piece together what the thing I saw beside the canal could have been, or why it had such a fascination with me after my chance encounter with it on the rat-stalked streets of Phnom Penh. No major news, official or unofficial, out of the Cambodian capital has commented on any strange disappearances or sightings, save a blog post I stumbled on one day by an animal shelter in the city, celebrating the sudden drop in the stray population in Phnom Penh, which I couldn't help but lay at the feet, or tail as the case may be, of a much more sinister presence than increased civic awareness. Perhaps it was several entities, the stalking being not a symptom of singular awareness, but rather of a hungry and growing population. I find this hard to believe, though, 
for the number of missing exsanguinated vagrants and night workers would be monumental. Equally hard to believe is the explanation of hallucinatory paranoia, for as comforting as it would be for me to sit here safe in the knowledge that no threat had ever been posed by the sniffing at my door and the snaking tongue worming its way through the fan, I have never in any period of stress or isolation since had any analogous experience, whether waking or sleeping. Rather, I've been forced to accept the possibility that, heavy as it weighs on my mind and disastrous as it is to my worldview, there is something monstrous stalking the canals, alleys, and rooftops of nocturnal Nam Pin. Mostly, perhaps, it feasts on dogs, rats, cats, and chickens as it claws its way through trash and across deserted streets. But occasionally, as I obsessively scroll through news feeds and blog entries made from Nam Pin in the dark of particularly solitary nights, I stumble across a story about declining homeless populations in Cambodia's capital, praising the uplifting grace of this or that government or non-profit initiative, and I am inclined to wonder how often someone, lying drunk or battered on the roads to sleep, is dragged down into the waters of the canals, never to surface again.